Well, good morning, everybody. Folks uh, present in the count of four, all of our cyber audience, ships at sea, wherever uh, you may find yourself. Glad that uh, you're with us here this morning, July the 3rd. Uh, um, and a uh, nice holiday weekend to look forward to. Hope everybody has sufficient fireworks in stock, uh, and plenty of bail money. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, anyway, off uh, off we go. Uh, uh, we're back to our uh, heat wave. We enjoyed those few days last week when it was temperatures were a little bit more moderate, and it's immoderate now, and it's going to stay that way for a while. So but anyway, anyway, uh, halfway through the year. Stop and think about it. We're halfway through 2022. I'm not sure what I did with that first half. I'm going to have to step my game up. <laughs> come, out, come out in a better spot here than anybody. Uh, thanks for being here. All of you are cyber. Like that shirt, Thank you. Yeah, I like that. Very, very <laughs> nice. I don't, you know, it's funny. I don't have any patriotic shirts. Well, I didn't anything. either, and I found this one at Belk's. Did you? On sale a couple of weeks ago. Well, you did good. I think so. You done good. I just thought I wore blue trousers and a red and white striped shirt. I thought that's that's the best closest <laughs> I'm going to get. And especially with, you know, with temperatures in the hundreds, there is absolutely, there's no one on this earth to run fast enough to get me to wear a tie today. So, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway i think somebody's out looking for some nutrition i can say <laughs> don't much blame him well anyway we'll be in first kings chapter 15 today and uh and uh, uh interesting uh interesting bit of history here and give us hopefully some time to to uh, uh kind of consider some things and uh and uh, the history of uh, Israel and Judah, as well as uh, maybe make some, I hope, good applications uh, for ourselves as well. So, anyway, before we dive in there, let's uh, begin with a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for uh, this day. I thank you, Lord, for uh, this time of year when we uh, reflect on uh, on our nation. And I thank you, Lord, for how you have blessed us and, and given us uh, so many wonderful opportunities and a uniqueness father of, among the nations that's uh, uh, is just uh, absolutely incomparable i pray father that you uh, you will always uh, allow us to glorify you uh, in a country that uh, specifically allows us to do that i pray we'll never ever take that for granted uh, and i just thank you lord for all the blessings in so many ways that you provide for us. Open our hearts, I pray, that we'll uh, understand and and, uh, and get to know you better, Father, from studying your word today. We ask in Jesus' name, Amen. So, First Kings fifteen. A little bit of little bit of background um, here. Uh, remember, last week we were dealing with our pal Jeroboam. Uh, Re well, both of them, Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Tweedledum and Tweedledee. Uh, trying to keep them apart is uh, good luck with that. Um, but <laughs> we'll get a little bit into a little bit more of the background and, and history uh, here of uh, kind of who's who's doing what. It, the whole thing is just an absolute mess. Um, and um, so, <clears throat> on the Judah side of things, uh, Rehoboam was. Um, um, was uh, succeeded on his death by his son Abijam, who managed to uh, keep it together for about three years. Uh, it was about all he all he was good for, uh, and uh, he was basically as big of a jerk as uh, his dad. Uh, didn't really amount to much, uh, and uh, and uh, he was then succeeded. Uh, by his son Asa, who is sort of our focus today, um, who we're going to kind of kind of zoom in on. 
and uh, to a great extent, Asa gets it together. Hey, what do you got there? A nutrition nugget. I know. Later. Do what? Well, what a coaster later. Well, we'll see about that. We'll see about that. I'm ready for a roller coaster too. Later. Later, yeah. Unfortunately, it's going to, have to be later. But because uh, there aren't any within reasonable distance at <laughs> this point. Um, but um, um, over on the on the uh, northern kingdom side in Israel, um, hey. it was e it was an even bigger fiasco. Uh, hey. Remember. First of all, that Jeroboam, um, I guess, well, I guess you could kind of say understandably from the political standpoint that he had. Here he had just led a successful revolution. Uh, you know, 10 of the 12 tribes uh, went with him, uh, basically. And, uh, and um, the problem was that where was the temple? Down in the southern kingdom. The temple was in Jerusalem, obviously, in the capital of the, of the southern kingdom. So, so uh, Jeroboam decided to do the obvious thing that any person would do is make him a couple of nice golden calves. Those stupid golden calves. Just, I mean, there's just there's one behind every corner, you know. Um, and the, the story. Why a golden calf? Well, I'm not gonna. You know, take 30 minutes to explain that. It goes back to days in Egypt, basically. Um, and, uh, but that golden calf was just something really special. So he made two of them, and he put one way up in the far north, up at Dan, which is the, about as far north as, you, as the kingdom went. So Dan is like the farthest north point. Then he put another one, um, <clears throat> basically just on just, just a stone's throw from Jerusalem, the border between north and south. It's a lot, if you're familiar with Korea, uh, you can almost throw a rock from Seoul to Pyongyang. I mean, they're very, very close together. Uh, those two capitals, they're just, uh, uh, Seoul is in the very northern part of southern Korea and Pyongyang is in the very southern part of North Korea. So you literally could just almost throw a rock uh, between one and the other, which they do frequently. Uh, but, other things. <laughs> among other things, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, some of those rocks explode on impact. Um, anyway, they uh, uh, that was kind of the situation. So he actually sets up the second golden. I think it was Bethlehem, which is just basically just about. I mean, just maybe ten miles or less from Jerusalem, just over the border. So that way, people don't have to go to Jerusalem to worship. Um, that's much more conveniently located to keep people in the kingdom. And of course that keeps, you know, you know, little tourist money going there, that never hurts. Um, and of course, you know, the Levites didn't want anything to do with that. Uh, so he just had to recruit his own, his own priests. Where'd you get that? Back there. Back there? Yeah. Boy, someone, someone thinks you're, oh, look at that, John. I think somebody around here thinks you must be starving Marvin. <laughs> <laughs> I, maybe, maybe later. Oh yeah. Maybe yeah. maybe oh, later. Yeah. I, I think I'm probably good for now. Um, but uh, um, anyway, that was basically the situation, trying to keep things a little bit, trying to keep people from having to interact much. Um, so uh, anyway, Jeroboam uh, on his death, uh, his son Nadab. Um, and boy, he was a jewel. Uh, he succeeded him. He, he only held on for two years, um, at which point uh, he was murdered by his uh, general. This is starting to sound, sound like a banana republic now, but his, uh, there was a big military coup. Beasha, his, uh, his leading general, knocked him off and, um, and um, uh, basically killed killed everybody and he was just about in fact he was at least as bad if not worse I think the, the big that the Jeroboam at least had some sort of a sense of 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 um, theology for lack of a better term uh, Baasha could care less he was absolutely godless 
godless guy. I mean, he didn't care, you know, you know, God schmod was kind of his deal. He didn't care, didn't make any difference to him, you know, but if, you know, basically a very, I don't know, I'm going to call him atheist or, or whatever, but that's really kind of his mindset. You know, God doesn't matter a, a, a hoot to him. Uh, and that's who uh, Bayasha is. And uh, anyway, um, uh, when he died, his son Ela again managed to get two years in before Zimri, who was his general, knocked him off. Uh, and, uh, and so Zimri leads this big revolution, coup, whatever you want to call it, junta. And, uh, and Zimri uh, manages to pull it off after his little coup and actually gets almost an entire week <laughs> as king uh, before Omri, 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 Omri uh, takes him out. And, uh, and that's the, uh, in fact, Zimri actually, actually committed suicide uh, when he was faced with uh, the opposition from, from Omri. And, uh, and Omri is now. Now here's another bunch of trying to get, try to keep Omri and Zimri apart. Mm -hmm. Try to figure out which is. Which, I have enough trouble with Evie and Ziva, you know. Uh, but uh, but this is uh, which is problematic. I told uh, Julie we were talking last night about possible names for. The, by the way, did I tell you it's a boy and a girl? Oh. Yeah, yeah. There is so which is great because I'm not going to have to write on their foreheads of sharpies and tell them yeah. apart. Uh, so uh, anyway, that's going to be really helpful. But uh, anyway, yeah, it looks like it's a boy and a girl. So uh, oh, very, very pleased and healthy as horses. Right. And Julie says she knows how healthy they are because even at this, I forget how many weeks you know, they are at this point, they apparently have volleyball practice <laughs> uh, frequently <laughs> at this point. So good sign. Yeah. Good sign. But, uh, but anyway, just I, think was, I, I lean toward heckle and jackal. <laughs> you know, uh, Sarah had come up with some even more creative uh, names, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, having a lot of fun with that. But uh, at any rate, uh, yeah, Omri and Zimri, and uh, and Zimri actually came came first. Like I say, managed to managed to be king for a whole week, not quite a whole week, and Omri knocked him off. <clears throat> so the most important thing about Omri. Ornery Omri was uh, that although uh, see, although Jeroboam had set up a golden calf and a little you know little little worship centers in the very far north, very far south of the kingdom, there really wasn't a capital per se. And if you can see why, I mean you know with these these generals killing each other off, taking over and setting up their little juntas for couple of years, it never really settled down. Omri was actually able to get things kind of stabilized a little bit, uh, similarly to kind of what Jeroboam had started. The most important thing Omri did, though, was set up a capital city, actually establish a national capital. And guess where he built it? His name's going to be real familiar. Doing his own work. Samaria. 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 That sound familiar? Mm -hmm. So you wonder why we get to Jesus' time and Samaritan is basically a cuss word. Hey. We were talking about that stuff earlier. <laughs> Ugh, I'd rather have cake. Um, but uh, anyway, yeah, so you mean I get to Jesus' time is he calling somebody a Samaritan is about the lowest form of life. And now you know why. And that's where it's. But Omri was the one who actually established uh, the capital uh, there at uh, at Samaria um, and we'll get to this more next week I think but uh, but uh, Omri had a uh, reasonable uh, length uh, of reign and then his son succeeded him and guess who Omri's son is best one of all Ahab so you know where we're going you know where we're going. Ahab was a Ahab was a milk toast. To be honest with you, Ahab was really kind of a milk toast. But he married way over his head. Mm -hmm. Boy, did he ever! 
and everybody knows, most people know Jezebel. Uh, hardly anybody even remembers Ahab except for the fact that, oh yeah, wasn't he married to Jezebel? Anyway, so, so that's kind of the overview, kind of the span and give you a little bit of background. We're focusing today on, uh, on uh, Asa. Um, and uh, after Rehoboam and, and, and Abijah, um, it, it, it's, it's wonderful that you finally get a breath of fresh air. And you get a king who at least is, is a lot more together. He's not perfect, but, um, but uh, he certainly is, uh, is uh, a lot better off than, uh, than where his dad and, and, and granddad had been. And uh, so uh, anyway, at uh, 1 Kings 15, we'll dive in on 9 and 10, and I'll spare you guys, whoever it might be. Uh, Gordon will probably be here. I'll spare you of the agony of trying to do these names, and I'll just read this. Uh, so uh, verse 9 says, uh, In the 20th year of Israel's king Jeroboam, Asa became king of Judah, and he reigned 41 years in Jerusalem. It's one of the longest reigns of any of the kings. Uh, his grandmother's name was Maaka, uh, daughter of uh, Abishalom. Now you notice the Shalom part in there. Okay. Um, and um, anyway, um, I think it's interesting, uh, and especially in the good king. There are some kings that they don't even tell you. You know, um, you know they don't want to embarrass their mom uh, for for naming her. But invariably, on these good kings. Uh, their mom always is mentioned, who their, who their mom is. Isn't that interesting? Now, this is long before Hallmark invented Mother's Day. Mm -hmm. So, remember. So, uh, oh, thank you, St. John. Oh, yeah. And um, anyway, I just, just think it's kind of, uh, kind of an interesting thing uh, to note. That's all we know about these people. You know, that we, get, we know their names and we know, um, you know, who his... Uh, who his his grandmother is, um, and uh, uh, and by the way, it, it, you probably already know this, but worth mentioning. It, especially, I'm all it's, it's true in Greek and in, as well in those genealogies, but in the genealogies in the Old Testament, um, you know, so and so, the son of so and so, the son of so and so. Sometimes that word son or descendant or whatever, <coughs> however you want to put it, uh, can span three or four or more generations. So, you know, you could say that uh, Moses is the son of Abraham. And that's true. But there were several others between him and Abraham. And so, so anyway, it, you, you really got to, if you're really interested in the details, you really got to have a pencil and paper map this stuff out uh, figure out who's who but I think the, the Holy Spirit he gave us that in that form and I think that's sufficient um, to uh, to uh, understand who's, uh, who's who's who here um, the uh, the most important verses though I think uh, to understand Asa are coming up and uh, somebody please read 11 through 15, and let's see what uh, what Asa did. Asa did what was right in the Lord's sight, as his ancestor David has done. Let me stop you right there. Who's the ultimate yardstick by which all these kings are measured? <laughs> David. David. And notice, uh, yeah, in this case, they use the word ancestor. Uh, the original was father, but of course, that would have made David his great, great, great grandfather, I think, right? But anyway, um, uh, but understand that and that, that all these kings are always going to be measured against David. Uh, nobody is ever going to quite measure up, uh, but he's the one by which they're always, to which they're always compared. Uh, so interesting to note. And of course, the very first thing that we're told is he did what was right in the sight of the, the, sight of the Lord. So I'm sorry to have interrupted you. Okay. Please, please go ahead. He banished the male cult prostitutes from the land and removed all of the idols that his ancestors had made. He also removed his grandmother, Mayaka, 
uh, from being queen mother because she had made the obscene image of <laughs> Asherah. Asherah, okay. Asia chopped down her, her obscene image and burned it in the Kindred Valley. The high places were take, were not taken away, but Asa was wholeheartedly devoted to the Lord his entire life. He brought his father's conservative, consecrated gifts and his own consecrated gifts to the Lord's temple, silver, gold, and utensils. So, uh, a, a really kind of an amazing thing. The first thing to understand is that banish the male cult prostitutes. Where in the world did they come from? Well, the temples, uh, I can't think of the name. Yeah, well, but, Baal and Asherah, that was, that, that was part and parcel of this stuff. Uh, even mentions the fact that uh, Mayaka had uh, had uh, built these, I mean, it specifically refers to them as obscene. And, you know, <laughs> it's a good thing. You know why you never saw any Sunday school pictures about this? <laughs> uh, this is gross. Yeah. And, and I think that, that uh, you know, when you, you get into some of this stuff, um, yeah, it's just, uh, it, it, it's, I'm so thankful that God's Word, you know, paints in pretty pure colors here uh, so that we really understand what's going on. But just to emphasize just the, the crass, I'm trying to think of, I'm, I'm just struggling to find the best words to describe uh, uh, Asherah and, and Baal. Understand that they are fertility deities. Okay, so you could just let your mind race and imagine what went on, um, you know, for for these. Uh, and it just it entirely appeals to the basest parts of our nature, and uh, which, of course, as uh, every advertiser knows, is where you make your money. <laughs> and so you know, we had mentioned. A long time ago, back three or four years ago, I think when we were studying in Ephesus, I, I think I made the comparison in calling calling Ephesus like a porno Disneyland of of, uh, I of the time. No, I know they have yeah, <laughs> roller coasters. Yeah, I know. Okay. Sorry, I wish I thought. But, oh well, <laughs> we'll be hearing that all day then. <laughs> oh well, that's okay. Anyway. Uh, um, yeah, just absolutely. I mean, just just perverse. It's just weird. And so, but understand how how long how many male cult prostitutes uh, were hanging around when David was king? I don't know that there's any. I believe you wouldn't even need one hand to count them because I don't believe they'd have lasted more than more than uh, more Our, uh, five minutes. Study guide says that that term used for male. Encompasses both male and female. It's correct, correct. Yeah, yeah, that that is true. Yeah, there wasn't just it, there was there was something for everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was something for everybody here. I mean, it's just yeah, you just couldn't go wrong. Um, you know, and um, and uh, but but the the fact that these that these people were so prevalent that it, it has to be mentioned here lets you see just how quickly uh, you think about it. This is. Uh, well, this is Solomon's great grandson, right? So we got Asa, Abijah, Rehoboam. Yeah, that'd be about right. Anyway, um, it doesn't take long for things to go to seed, folks. Um, I mean, Solomon it, wasn't doing a great job. Well, no, and that was the thing: is uh, Solomon is the son of David, and uh, and Solomon basically is the one that opens the door for all this stuff, and. Uh, and boy, once that door gets open, you know, you don't have to crack that door very wide before it's just absolutely uh, a nightmare. And so you can see how rapidly it's, it's, it's taken on. So anyway, he, uh, he got rid of them um, and he was very, very aggressive, obviously, in taking these Asherahs and all these other things and basically just grinding them up. I don't know exactly. They typically were wooden. Uh, they they were, could be stone or other thing, but typically sort of a totem pole kind of a thing, of a, of a, of a deal. 
whatever he did to it, he chopped, I guess took a chainsaw and just absolutely carved it down to nothing. People didn't know they had chainsaws back then. Yeah, probably not. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, then basically took it out and, I mean, absolutely destroyed. They took the, basically took the wood chips and burned them to, to ashes I mean, to make sure that there was absolutely nothing, nothing left. Um, high places, you know, we've encountered those um, a bit here. The high places weren't necessarily idolatrous. They, you know, there were there were those who worship Yahweh in the on these these high places, but they more and more and more become associated with idol worship. Uh, later on, we're going to run into a really interesting high place way up on the coast in the northern kingdom and the figures very prominently but uh, but uh, they're not necessarily bad uh, but they're not necessarily good they're just convenient spots uh, gathering places if you will and uh, and uh, they uh, uh, the most significant thing though was that God had given them very specific instructions that the people were to worship one place and one place only, and that was the tabernacle. And they were all to come together specifically three times a year uh, for specific uh, festivals, feasts, festivals. Only, interesting too, by the way, you notice that in all the worship, all of God's worship and the worship that he established for, uh, for Israel, um, how many of them were feasts? Big, happy parties? Seems like most. Only one fast day. Only one day a year was designated for fasting, which was on before the Day of Atonement. Uh, that was the only fast day. The rest of the days were feasts. They were festivals. Even Passover, anything is a is a festival. Um, and uh, you know, I mean, and I think that's to me that speaks volumes in how we worship God and how we approach God. Uh, it's it's a festival, it's it's a feast, uh, it's uh, it's just an inexpressible joy to realize He loves us so much. He sent His Son. You know, I mean, how can you? I don't know. I just the the, the incredulousness of that, the incredible joy and and, and delight and that just just has to get us with to realize, yeah, He loved us that much. Yeah, He did. You know, and I think it's that joyful thing, and I think it's the joy that we feel as a result of that realization. I think that ultimately pushes us out into the world uh, to our friends and our neighbors, the people we encounter, and want to tell them about Jesus. You know, you want to tell. You know, sad sack walks up there, looks like he's been eating a pickle. You know, walks up. Jesus How attractive. You know, um, I, I think sometimes, uh, of course, there's always the one with the big stick. <laughs> you know, Jesus loves you, and if you don't love him, I'm going to whack him. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's, but we, we have taken so many weird approaches to this thing. But let's look at, in, in this case, just to reflect very quickly on, on God's system of worship that he gave these people. It was all joyful. There was only one day specifically set aside obviously for an extremely important reason to to reflect on ourselves instead rather we every other day reflects on god one day a year we look in a mirror and we look at ourselves and we realize how badly we need a loving gracious god and uh, and that was of course what Count Kapoor is all about so just anyway just to mention so so you know, these gathering places, I'm calling them that for a reason, to kind of tweak somebody the parks department, but these gathering places were, were designed to be, you know, the high places were designed to be basically, you know, I mean, almost like picnic ground, if you will. Um, but God had specifically said, no, you, there's only one place you actually worship, and that's the tabernacle. I, I believe, personally, that the temple is a shadow of what the tabernacle had been. Certainly not in terms of grandeur uh, or in the beauty of it. Yeah, cool, it's right. 
uh, or the you know the, how attractive, but in terms of representing what God was trying to represent with that, um, you know, with the, the tabernacle. There is a message about Messiah, and there's a picture of Messiah in the tabernacle that just doesn't work in the in the temple. Uh, and of course, when we look at Revelation and we watch what our Lord Jesus is doing right at this very instant, guess what it looks like? It looks like he's in the holy place in the tabernacle. <coughs> wow. Stop and think about that a little bit. So, anyway. Did you go to the five, six years ago? I don't remember. They had the, the replica of the tabernacle. Did you go to that? I didn't, and I wish I, I, wish I had. And it, it was shocking small oh yeah oh yeah just tiny it's not that big and you say how did the people get around this yeah yeah if, if they were thousands or hundreds of thousands I just well if when you see when you see like uh, you know like when they have these huge you know sacrifices and they bring mm -hmm. so many bulls and stuff in that where in the world did they put them? yeah it was uh, obviously I, pretty efficient I asked Jonathan one time uh, when he was preaching on that. I said, you know, Jonathan, I'm a butcher. Where in the world did all the blood go <laughs> if you're sacrificing millions of, and he said millions uh -huh. of animals. But yeah. That's an aside. I'm sorry to get you off. No, it isn't. It isn't at all. It's a, it, it's a good point. Yeah, we, we tend to think in a little bit different scale. You could, I think you could put the tabernacle up in the parking lot. You could put it, on, put it in this auditorium. It's that small. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's not. It's not all that big, and the temple itself is even smaller to a great extent. I mean, and it's it's the holy of holies is just yeah. tiny. Yeah, it's really small. Yeah, yeah. You could fit that whole thing in this room, and and so you you think about that. It's it's really interesting to to understand is that you know what I I should have brought up. I didn't think I was going to talk about, it, but I have a. Uh, I have a cubit. <laughs> 18 inches. Mm -hmm. huh? 18 inches. Yeah, I've got a it's a little, little yeah, it, it can vary some, but I've got a cubit um, that I keep around handy mm -hmm. just in case. And I should have brought that. Um, and um, anyway, uh, just to kind of give you the scale, but basically foot and a half. You know, so when you start going through and look at, you know, 30 cubits, that's 45 feet. You know. I mean, yeah. It's that they're very. I don't think there's a single house down here, down the street that's that's uh, that's uh, um, that, that is less than. What am I trying to say? Forty-five feet wouldn't even be the back wall of one of these. You know, almost any house in this neighborhood. It's interesting to think about. Uh, anyway. Uh, I, I, I love what it mentions here uh, that, uh, that uh, you know, Asa is uh, bringing uh, gifts. Um, and that, it's interesting that that hasn't been mentioned uh, yet. You know, these, we know Solomon did, but after Solomon, we don't have any real record of uh, Rehoboam or Abijah uh, contributing anything of their own uh, to uh, worship, you know, to the temple. Uh, but we do see Asa. Uh, Asa, rather, doing doing that. And so he's putting his own money. Uh, he's actually paying his tithe uh, to the temple. And um, and it's interesting, silver, gold. The utensils, obviously, you know, those are used in the, in the, the worship. And uh, that is definitely a, I'd call it wholehearted. Mm -hmm. he's, uh, he's got skin in the game. Mm -hmm. uh, can't beat that. Uh, now, this is not exactly peace and tranquility. There are problems, and he's got problems to deal with. So 16 through 19 kind of lead us into that. Asa was always at war with King Baasha of Israel. One time, Baasha invaded Judah and captured the town of Ramah. He started making the town stronger so he could put troops there to stop people from going in and out of Judah. When Asha heard about this, he took the silver and gold from his palace and from the Lord's temple. He gave it to, the, to some of his officials and sent them to Damascus with this message 
for King Ben-Hadad ben -Hadad. of Syria. Yes. Forget whose son and stuff he is. <laughs> Skip a bit. <laughs> Our father signed a peace treaty. Why don't we do the same thing? The silver and gold is a present for you. So would you please break your treaty with the Asha and force him to leave my country? Um, really interesting uh, little turn of events here. You know, uh, he's, he's doing a great job. You know, here you have, you know, domestic policy, foreign policy. Uh, domestic policy have no problem here. Foreign policy, not sure. But he is obviously responding. Bayasha, who is a general, remember? I mean, he's a military guy. Uh, first thing he realizes is one of the smartest things he could do is to sort of isolate uh, the enemy. Uh, and uh, major road running north out of Jerusalem uh, Runs, uh, runs right through Rama, so what would be a more obvious place? And by the way, I should mention this, Rama is actually in Judah territory. It's not in Israel, it's just south of the border, so they're kind of nibbling away at it. It's a map in the back of our... Oh, good. It's the map. Good, that's a good map. Yeah, yeah. I have trouble seeing it without my reading glass. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I have to get mine out, but yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but Rama is just right. To, is is in Judah territory, Judah's territory, uh, a little bit north of Jerusalem. But it's right on that main road. So if he can block that out, he's really causing problems. Now, I mean, he's he's got a stranglehold on commerce, and as it <coughs> says, he's he can prevent you know the language used to prevent anybody from interacting with with uh, Asa, and that's exactly, you know, diplomatically, economically, anyway, he's, he's got him cut off. Um, and so, uh, Asa's reaction is very interesting. Um, he, uh, uh, he basically empties the entire treasury. He spends every penny, he gets every penny he has together, gets a delegation, and sends them to Syria. Now, I want you to stop and think. Think in modern times right now. Uh, who is the last person on earth you would expect Israel to be asking a favor from? Iran. Well, you know, in Syria, of course, even closer. Yeah. Uh, Syria's next door. You know, at least Iran is a little bit farther away. Syria's right there next door. And what has been going well over the past several years, of course, there's been this horrible civil war uh, raging in uh, Syria. That's been going at least, what, eight, nine years now? Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to remember the name of that uh, adult. That, uh, it's uh, the, the ruling family. I can't remember their names now. The ruling family in there, and there's a couple of generations now, uh, actually belong to this very tiny minority um, cult, basically. You know, they, they, there are cults in Islam, the same as there are cults in, in uh, uh, Christianity, and they belong to one of these funny little, little cults. Uh, I don't even think there's like two or three percent of the entire uh, population in Syria is uh, is uh, one of these folks, but uh, I don't want to start to draw comparisons. That's that's not. But uh, but basically, they're they're kind of oddballs, and uh, but they have it's but it does set up one of these situations where you've got a very small minority ruling over a vastly larger majority that never lasts. Uh, I cannot find a single example in history where that lasts very long. Uh, that was one of the, the major things that, uh, that caused the collapse of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was run, was run by who? By Russia, specifically by Russians in Russia. And, uh, but Russians are a minority, were a minority in the Soviet Union. And it 
wasn't taking too long for the rest of them to realize that and say, what are we listening to those jerks for? You know, uh, a lot of those people who really didn't much care for having Russians tell them what to do with folks down in Ukraine. And they felt that way for at least three or 400 years, you know? So I say that just to mention what's going on down there, you know, now and all that stuff. It's not new. These are things that go back years and years. Hello, welcome. Hello. And um, so it's, it's, you know, these situations are what they are. How on earth, given, I mean, the situation, it wasn't that much different than today, except that the, the country was intact at that point. How on earth could Israel, or Judah, in this case, specifically, uh, want to go up and, and, and ask for help Especially, you know, taking, here's all of our money, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Uh, Syria, could you please help us out here? Assad, that's it, mm -hmm. Assad, that's the, anyway. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just inconceivable. Now, on that map, does that map, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, so if you have that little map there in the back of your deal, uh, look way up there where Damascus is. You gotta look right at the very top up there. Uh, sort of in the upper right hand corner is Damascus, the capital of, uh, of Syria. How close is that to Judah? They had to sneak away and around <laughs> to get there. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how many camels that took. But, uh, but anyway, this is like, You know, and it's just, it's just so unlikely to, to, to see, but they were, on the other hand, they were in fact a dominant power. Uh, they were very strong. How strong is Judah at this point? Well, they're not. You know, they're, they're depleted, especially after he cleans Since out. Since hired mercenaries. To that's absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, that's exactly what he's doing. He, and he's breaking the bank to do it. Um, he mentions a treaty here, uh, there's no record of that treaty, uh, hmm. either scripturally or in what little uh, secular uh, evidence there is. Uh, scripture certainly doesn't mention it. Um, so I don't know where it came from. I mean, I'm, I'm, I am, obviously it's, it's recorded this way in scripture. It's obviously there was a treaty. He mentions, you know, you know, our fathers, and again, you know, that can mean, you know, who knows? It could go back to David or Saul for that matter. I don't know, uh, but anyway, whatever it is, um, he asks him to break, you know, to honor the treaty with basically, if you think about it, you made that. And, and now here's where you start to get into some really fun European royal politics here, okay? back in the day, um, you made that treaty with, um, you know, the king, I'm assuming, the king in Jerusalem. Well, these northern kingdoms, the, the king, ultimately, they're not there yet, but ultimately the king in Samaria, okay, um, is not the one you made that treaty with. Therefore, you really, by right, that treaty is invalid. The treaty you have with Baasha is invalid with Israel, uh, is invalid. Only the one you made with the king in Jerusalem over Judah is actually the valid treaty. Following that? Yep. I knew you would. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's one of those things where, you know, it gets into these weird legal, you know, and like laws of nations, international law and stuff, and, and you go back these are the kinds of things that start world wars, you know, when, when well, I made that treaty with you, but I didn't make that treaty with you, and, and, and yeah, you know, they all get so tangled and convoluted. But the legal argument is, is and apparently, um, you know, all the law books in the world don't speak quite as loud as that sparkly gold and silver <laughs> and all that other stuff. Uh, that they also took with them. Funny how how uh, convincing those things can be. Yeah. And uh, so, result. Someone read uh, 20 and 21, please. 
He did, by the way, 1 Kings 15. So here we go. Oh. Ben Hadad listened to King Asa and sent the commanders of his armies against the cities of Israel. He attacked Ijon, Dan. So a couple of other places. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, and the know. whole land of Naphtali. In 21? Yeah, please. When Baasha heard about it, he quit building Rama and stayed in Tirza. Yeah, good enough. Good enough. I am so sorry. I, I, I feel like I come across these things. I feel like I'm putting you on the spot and trying to make you, you know, practice your Hebrew grammar here. Um, yeah, so anyway, I could say the money talks, and it talked loud enough to get Ben Haydad's attention. So first thing he does, he gets him a couple of, I don't know, a couple of regiments. I don't know what it took. But anyway, probably not much, but he went down and uh, started beating up. Where did he start? The only one that you can pronounce. Dan. Dan. Dan, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, getting, you know, now where's Dan? The far north. Mm -hmm. Okay, now where is Syria? Well, it's north of there, right? So obvious place to start. And uh, so he gets into the, he just starts in the north and just starts. It's a chance for him to double his money. Absolutely. No, I, you better believe it. <laughs> you better believe it. Oh yeah. And it was a commercial center. It was on a you know kind of a trade route and everything. So oh yeah. But he did double his money, probably more than that. And uh, so he starts beating up on him up there, basically in the north. Now where is uh, where is Rama? Well, Rama is actually in the northern part of Judah territory, which means the extreme south. Barely in the purple on the Yeah, north. yeah. It's just right over the border, but it is, it is in fact, the extreme south, southern part of uh, the kingdom of Israel. Uh, so when Baasha learns that uh, Ben-Hadad is up there uh, way, way laying him up in the north, then and where is he? He's as far south as he can go. Actually, farther south than he should have gone. Uh, what happens to that other project at, uh, at uh, Rama? Do that later. Yeah, we're going to have to get back to that. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to have to get up here and deal with this, with this other mess. Uh, and uh, anyway, all of this stuff, it, it is pretty much, pretty much limited that, you know, what Ben Ada is doing in the north. There isn't any point. He isn't going to stretch his legs that much. But it, it did, how much did it take? You know, certainly not much because they didn't have much. Israel didn't have much of an army at that point, and so they're very, very limited what they could do. So, um, anyway, um, now exactly what Baasha did, I don't know. That isn't really recorded, um, and uh, whatever it was, I guess it was sufficient. But the point was, who cares, really? Uh, what's more important is what Asa did, and that's verse 22. Somebody read that for us, please. Somewhere. 22. Yeah. I'm sorry, you guys. Oh, that's fine. Or you want someone else to read? Yeah, I want something else. I'll read Okay. Maybe we'll get, okay. Maybe, we'll get the order card and run him. Then King Asa gave a command to everyone without exception in Judah. And they carried away the stones of Rama <laughs> and the timbers Basha had built with it, built it with. Then King Asha built Geba of Benjamin and Mitzvah with them. Yeah. So this is absolutely, this is absolutely brilliant. Um, so they had started this big building project, you know, and they had, you know, what that looks like. You know, I can't wait till I have have my next one going here um, but you know they've gone through they've gotten all the ground all leveled out they got the bulldozers out and then meanwhile back over here off to one side they've got big old pallets piled full of lumber and, and bricks and, and steel and all the stuff that they need to build this this magnificent uh, I mean it's been building before absolutely absolutely and boy they got the supplies all set there that's when they also hears about, oh, by the way, Ben Haydad just captured Dan, you know, and levied a tax, <laughs> among other things. And uh, 
they panic and they head north. And so this is, remember, they're still in Israel. They're, I mean, Judean territory here. So what do the, the people of Judah do? Look at that nice lumber yard. <laughs> That's like a Home Depot on steroids. So uh, they pretty much cleaned that puppy out and uh, used that stuff to build, actually to fortify some other places in Judah uh, to make sure that, uh, that uh, Israel was uh, was kind of kept at bay for a while, and and it's interesting here that uh, you know we we see Jeroboam was the first king of Israel, right? Led the, the revolution, split off of the ten northern tribes. Jeroboam, and you notice that Asa takes becomes king of Judah while Jeroboam is still on the throne. So you, it helps you understand just how long you know that was. You know, Rehoboam, uh, Abijah, and Asa, three kings, and Jeroboam still on the throne uh, in the north. Uh, <laughs> that situation changes completely radically uh, as uh, Asa's reign, 40-some 40, 40 years, and all this chaos and backstabbing and competing juntas and, and, uh, and uh, revolutions and counter-revolutions and military coups and all these other things that are taking place um, I guess the big question and, and we see it isn't at this particular point but down the road uh, we'll encounter I hope I haven't looked that far ahead but I hope we'll encounter another king of Judah who basically did pretty much the same thing that Asa did and got called on the carpet by it one of the one of the fact one of the prophets uh, went up and said, uh, you know, do you think the Lord's arm is so short <laughs> that well, he isn't aware? Our, our lesson talks about chronicles where Asa was called in for this. That's right. That's right. That's right. Uh, yeah, that's true. That's true. It is in chronicles, isn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> and, and it happens again later mm -hmm. as well. But yeah, uh, but the prophet basically said, you know, do you think the Lord is so, is so weak you know, the Lord is so, is so puny that, that he can't rescue you that you've got to go up there and call on Syria? Really? You know? That's like, uh, is the United States, are we so... Don't go there. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying, trying to make it. I don't want to But it would be like saying... If someone say, is the United States so weak that we've got to go down and, and ask the Costa Rican army to come bail us out, you know, because those mean Canadians are beating us up. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Now, obviously, there's a whole lot wrong with, the, with all of that, but yeah, but it would just about be, you know, you know, God, the, the almighty God, eternal God, uh, knows what's going on. And instead of, of beginning with uh, prayer to him and, you know, calling the priests and Levites uh, together, um, who do you call? Well, Department of State, uh, you know, Department of Treasury. <laughs> Actually started there, didn't it? Uh, and, uh, you know, so let's all sit around and criticize uh, Asa for that. Uh, Asa later on, in fact, and King's going to cause him out on the fact that he gets what's described as a foot disease. Uh, it's really difficult to know what that might have been. Could have been gout. I think to me, gout makes the most sense or something because obviously he was very debilitated. And of course, uh, <coughs> in, you know, in this particular. Time, nobody understood what gout was, um, and uh, and so you know it would have been. I mean, it literally would have been crippling uh, and Sugar agonizing. Huh? Sugar diabetes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, they're they're both metabolic kinds of kinds of, uh, of issues. And uh, yeah, it, it could have been a diabetic thing that had caused uh, uh, paralysis or. Neuropathy type conditions, 
a number of, of things it, it could have been. Uh, my my yeah, ankles, it's, if my right one doesn't hurt, the left one does. I have, over the years, I have injured both of my ankles repeatedly. Um, and uh, now as I'm approaching, approaching middle age. <laughs> <laughs> You're the teacher. You're not supposed Sorry. to say that. I'm not supposed to lie like a dog anyway. Anyway, I know. Forgive me. Forgive me. Uh, vanity is all vanity. Uh, but, um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, now fortunate I can, still, I can still get around, but this was debilitating. This was real. I mean, my stepdad, I watched him get his legs cut off. Oh, yeah. You do the diabetes. Yeah, yeah, you can get the part of the process in, in diabetes, great when it's clearly controlled, is you'll start to get some really serious vascular, peripheral vascular damage, peripheral, peripheral vascular disease. And, uh, yeah, and, and particularly uh, leg amputations, and leg amputations, very, very common. And, uh, and uh, so, uh, yeah, so it, it's, it's a, we don't know exactly, we can speculate. Uh, but here was the problem. Here's where God criticized him. What did he do first? Did he pray or call the doctor? He well, called the doctor before he prayed, basically. So anyway, and I guess like I said a while ago, let's all sit around and let's all point fingers at uh, Asa, you know, for just how weak his faith was and everything. Don't dare look in a mirror. <laughs> Why are you doing that? Right? I, one of the questions that came to my mind when I started thinking about this, and I don't claim to be much of a scholar, but you've got these third generation away from who taught him? Where did it come from? It wasn't his grandmother. He fired her. Obviously not. He fired her. So, yeah. Uh, where I mean, did God just lay it on him? Did he run into a priest somewhere, that, uh, or a rabbi, I should say? Uh, well, actually, they didn't have rabbis yet. Well, the, the rabbis are, are later, a later invention. It is priests and Levites, okay. and the scribes. So they didn't have scribes. Yeah. So it's I, yeah. Where where did his training wasn't the, wasn't that way? No, if he no, he wasn't his daddy or granddaddy. No, you know, his his dad or granddad, you know, could give a hoot for for uh, God in heaven. They could care less, you know. They kind of lip service. Uh, you know, and it's a and it's a great question. I think the best answer to that is just to understand the persistence of uh, of God's word and, and God's mm -hmm. plan. By whatever means or method, I, I'm on the understanding on the human scale. Even though they didn't really care much for the, you know, God didn't really enter much into their lives. <clears throat> Apparently, there was still enough mention. I mean, you had David. David himself, as a I'm preteen. Yes. But God picked him out. <laughs> You know, because Absolutely. of his heart, not because of his training. Absolutely. Because he was just out there taking care of the sheep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, the run of the family. Uh, and, uh, yeah, and that was the one God chose. So, I don't know. God's, God's will, God's plan, God's purpose manages to work through. Now, it's going to get worse. You, you realize we're still at least within a handful of generations now from David. As we go on down the road, it's going to get worse. And there's several, you know, in our studies we're going to see that you wonder, it's even more miraculous how they actually, because at this point, it, you, you reach a couple of points in here where it looks like they have completely <laughs> forgotten Yahweh. That they don't even, they don't even know. Well, you know why we don't know how to spell or pronounce it properly today? Two reasons. One, because of mechanics of Hebrew not having yeah, this, say no vowels. the old Hebrew not having vowels. Alexander the Great invented vowels as far as Hebrews were when he brought Greek. That was where the Hebrews got the idea to put vowels in words. But remember they would not they would not pronounce that out of reverence, but 
but at some point, it just even the people who knew just quit passing along as well. Uh, Yahweh is the vowels from whenever a, an observant Jew would come across that, uh, they would simply refer to it as Hashem, which means the name. And that's what they would call it. So we took the vowel, the A and the E from, from Hashem and inserted those between them. Y-H-W-H, and that's where we, we got, where we get Yahweh, and how that's derived, whether that's correct or not. But it doesn't make any difference. We know who he is. And most important, we know him. And the ultimate revelation of him through his son. Who is, remember, descended from Asa? As much as he is from Jeroboam and Abel. <laughs> Rehoboam, I beg your pardon. See, I have trouble. I can't tell one from the other. Zimri and Omri and Jeroboam, but whatever, anyway. Fortunately, with that guffaw, it's time to go. <laughs> so I think that's a great execute. Uh, thank you for being here this morning and joining us. And, uh, and uh, more, uh, more of the adventures of La La Land uh, here next week, but it all has an application, doesn't it? I mean, some of this stuff, you look at it, and it's kind of like reading paper, you know? Uh, human government, uh, I think without any kind of government, any, anything that we do, any human activity, without dependence and foundation uh, in uh, the Lord Almighty is futile. And we see some of that here. I mean, was the ending okay? Well, I guess. You know, but did the uh, end justify the means? God didn't seem to think so, did he? You know, great lessons of dependence, and I'm sure not gonna, not gonna sit there and go nani nani boo boo at, at Asa because I do the same thing. You know, I think all of us do, and uh, we've got technology. You know, that's a great thing. Now, well, technology. If you carry, we're already past time, but if you carry it to the end, yeah, uh, we shouldn't go see a doctor. We just rely on God. And that's, but, but my my answer is that he, might, he gave us the doctor. God's the one who gave he us gave, the doctor. He gave them the smarts to, yeah. to be able to do the things they absolutely. do. Absolutely, absolutely. And the technology is mm -hmm. able to do that. No, absolutely. I fully agree with that. Yeah, but that's a gift from God. But I think what God is saying is, don't put all your faith and trust in those doctors right. before you picked up the phone to make an appointment. Pray about it. <laughs> you then die. And I got him on speed dial. <laughs> so, you know. So anyway, uh, yeah. Good good point. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, okay, well, let's have a wonderful Fourth of July weekend and uh, and say again, try not to try not to hurt yourself or anybody else with your fireworks. That's right, John. Penis Day. Is what? Penis Day. I Independence Day. That's yeah. exactly right. And I like that better than calling the 4th of July yeah. Independence yeah. Day. Holiday. But it is a holiday. Yeah. You get to stay home tomorrow, don't you? Yeah. You think we can get a sneaky lunch in that Mom won't know about? Yeah. Something, <laughs> something that doesn't involve a lot of green stuff? Yeah. We'll see. Actually, she's off too, so <laughs> <laughs> that's going to be that's gonna be a hard one to pull off. You may need to go to hard work for a bit more stuff. I need all that. <laughs> taco. You and me and Gordon are going to go get a taco. Huh? We're going to go out and eat us some cheap tacos at the hardware store. Good plan, man. All right. Well, thanks for being here. Let's have a word of prayer. We'll be dismissed. Father, just thank you so much for the, 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 all the great things that we share in your name. We just thank you, Lord, for, for giving us this record of, of history. Uh, and just holding a mirror up, up to us uh, and uh, that we can see ourselves that we can we can see the times in which we live uh, reflected in times past most important father we see you at work uh, and we see your constant involvement your constant uh, your constant presence uh, even though it's it, some of these and some of us don't always acknowledge it and thank you lord that 
things aren't getting by you, that you are in control, uh, that you do know what's going on and that your will is uh, being carried out uh, and your plan is going forward. And I just thank you, Lord, you've revealed that to us. And assure us, I pray, Father, uh, give us confidence in that and boldness as we tell, uh, tell others uh, about our Lord Jesus and about salvation uh, in Him. And I just, uh, just pray you'll uh, give us a great uh, time of reflection on the blessing that you give us, living in our wonderful country, make us good citizens of heaven as well as good, uh, good citizens of, of our country as well. And I pray that all the things we do in all these areas, Father, first and foremost brings honor and glory to you in jesus name amen all right see you next time